Hey, I don't like to be told no, and it makes me angry. And the problem is that nobody likes an angry person. Nobody wants to hear from an angry Christian, but I don't like to be told no. I don't know if anybody else resonates with that or not. My wife revealed that to me this last week. She said, you know, Rick, she goes, one of your problems, and it's just one, I didn't ask her for the list of the rest of them. She goes, one of your problems is you just don't like to be told no. And I'm like, so what? Nobody likes to be told no. It makes me angry and nobody likes an angry person. Today, we're in week five of the seven deadly sins, seven things you can definitely do to totally destroy your life if you want to. We don't want to, so we're trying to bulletproof our life by evaluating these seven areas, not coming from a list Jesus gave in scripture, simply coming from church history, but certainly applying to biblical themes. Today, we're gonna be talking about anger. The last two weeks were really tough ones to teach and prepare for. We talked about gluttony, three weeks ago. We talked about lust two weeks ago, last week. And then today is going to be a little easier, anger. We can all relax and smile and nod our heads and say guilty and not get judged by the person next to you because everybody deals with anger. Now let's look at this together as we get into this subject today. And I think that you're going to enjoy it. Pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger. Next week, greed. Then the final, final week, sloth. Um, in Psalms, the author says, stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. Now, we could just close the message right there and say, go to lunch. And um, it would be sufficient if we would do it. If we would read the Bible and go, you know what? I'm just going to stop it. I'm just going to cut it out. I'm just going to stop being angry. I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm going to turn from all that nonsense and I'm going to live a different way. I hope you want to, but it's not just a matter of willpower. It's a matter of willpower given to the Holy Spirit and God's power living within you and you and I responding a different way. And so if you're an angry person, if you find that you live in a circumstance or a world that ticks you off, if you're paying attention and find from time to time things are not the way they ought to be, then stick around because we're going to work through that this morning together. As we cover a topic each week, would you do me a favor and ask yourself this question? Not should my mom or dad hear this? Not should my kids hear this? Not should my spouse hear this? Should I hear this? Does this apply to me? Am I in any way an angry person? An angry person finds themselves cynical, finds themselves bitter, finds themselves unforgiving, finds themselves negative, and nobody likes to be around an angry person. Angry people are unsafe emotionally, certainly potentially physically. I hope none of us are unsafe physically when we're angry, but we can be emotional assassins just like a physical assassin. We can be relational assassins through our anger and we may not shoot bullets, but what we shoot wound just as badly. And it usually wounds the people closest to us. Angry parents make angry kids. Angry people generally gravitate toward angry friends. Anger festers and it spreads and it infects and nobody likes an angry person. Nobody likes an angry Christian. And can I just tell you, Christians are just far too angry. Now, it's not that you can't have righteous anger. Put a pin in that. We're coming back in the second half of our teaching time to righteous anger. But most of us don't have righteous anger. We just aren't getting what we want. We don't want to be told no. So ask yourself, is this me. Now let's move on. We have a lot of ground to cover and I don't want us to waste any time. Anger is a strong passion or emotion of displeasure often caused by a sense of injury or insult. The injury or insult might be real. And anger is not really a direct response. It's not something where you sit back and you go, I am going to get angry now. It's an indirect response. It comes from something else, an external stimulus. The way I look at it is there's something living within me a little bit of an anger sort of a tendency. And as soon as I get provoked in any way, it pops up and goes, here we go, right? And, and so anger, even though it lives within, must be controlled. Because if not, 
anger destroys. But we don't think about it intentionally and say, now I'm going to experience anger. Most of the time, it's just there. We live with it, but it doesn't mean it's always our friend. Let's keep going. And you have your notes, by the way, in your PDF. Complete this statement. If I was going to totally ruin my life, your life, my kids' lives with anger, I would definitely live this way. I would let everything tick me off. I would hold offenses of the past just like they were offenses of today. I wouldn't forgive anyone. I would become bitter. I would look at the world as a glass half full. I'd be suspicious of the people around me and prickly like a porcupine. And I would see my kids begin to emulate that behavior. My friends begin to become infected with that. Everyone I touch becomes a little less positive, a little less optimistic, a little less filled with love. And as I walk through this world, the wake that I live behind is a wake that nobody should leave behind, especially a Christian. I want to destroy their life. I'll tell them, become an angry person. Irrelevant in the cause of the kingdom and dangerous in relationship and in our faith. So if we see it, we got to kill it because if we kill it, our relationship with God and with others can be amazing. But anger can be hidden and can show up in surprising ways. If you were with us during the series on love from 1 Corinthians 13, we covered some of these things. And I want to remind you because there are things that I felt this week as I studied, I needed to be reminded of. One, procrastination can be a form of anger. It's very passive aggressive. If you're a procrastinator, it can just be a personality characteristic where you're disorganized and we have to work through that or it could be a passive aggressive, intentional or non-intentional approach to letting the world around you know that you're just not happy with things or with them. The second thing, habitual lateness. It's disrespectful and it can be shown as a sign of anger. It's passive aggressive, but yet oftentimes is a sign of anger. The world is not the way that it should be. If not, it's a sign of pride. I'm more important than you are. My time is more important than you. So sit there and wait on me. Something I work on could be caused by a personality trait, could be caused by, in my case, oftentimes I'll schedule things too closely together where I don't allow enough margin. Not an excuse, just an explanation because I wanna make sure that's not me. I'm not that kind of person. Number three, a sarcastic person, a cynical person or a flippant person. You ever been around somebody that's just sarcastic? Everything's just sarcasm. I mean, they always have something to say and it's just never really positive. It's always just a little off and you're just not 100% sure where they're coming from or you are sure and you just don't like it, could be a sign of anger. Number four, frequent sighing or huffing. We have some of that in my house and it's not from me. And there's only two people who live there, but my wife has now involuntarily trained my dog and my dog will huff at me now when my dog is not happy. So I'll get the wife huff and then I'll get the dog huff. Um, is she angry? I don't know. You'll have to ask her. Um, number five, excessive irritability over little things. The porcupine syndrome. Everything just irritates me. Everything irritates me. Road rage is a great example. You know, there was a study funded by our government, no surprise, on road rage. And um, the result was this. You may be surprised. Road rage happens a lot. And there is a predictor of road rage. The number, the amount of stickers on the back of someone's vehicle is in direct proportion to the higher percentage that they will be perpetrators of road rage. Now you may think, well, I know who those are. It's like the, you know, honk again, I'm reloading stickers, but it's not, it's the coexist stickers too. It doesn't matter what kind of stickers they are. It just seems like the people with the most opinions are the ones that want their space on the road. And, and I think that's a little unusual. Again, going back to my wife, because we live together and she loves to point things out in me as I do from time to time for her, taking you all the way back to last week when I talked about driving. Once again, we found ourselves in the car. Yesterday, I wouldn't tell you another story about this except it really happened and it really applies. Yesterday, someone was trying to kill me three times when I was driving. There were three idiots on the road, three stupid people. And every time it made me really, really upset. The third time and I'd had enough, a semi well, on the freeway flips on the blinker, starts to come over, you know, like they do. There are some professional drivers and then there are some people who have no business to be behind the wheel of anything, especially an 18 wheeler starts pushing me into the median. And I got a little upset 
I could break safely, but I got a little upset. My wife looked over at me and she said once again, you know what one of the problems is? You don't just let stupid people do what they want to do and just back up and relax. And I said, you married a boy. There is no way that I'm going to just let people do whatever they want and I'm going to relax. And, and I want to point something out to you. Anger, even a temper, is not sin. An uncontrolled anger or an uncontrolled temper is sin. The feeling of anger that wells up, the response that lies within, even the application of anger under the correct circumstances, which we'll talk about in a minute, is not sin. But it's uncontrolled anger that's sin. If any of these seem true, we might be angry. And once we know, we have to deal with it. Let's keep moving. This is fun. The underlying cause of anger can be frustration. Many people are angry because they're frustrated. And life is frustrating. Life is frustrating. Just, I'm not getting what I want. As a matter of fact, I want to suggest you try this from time to time, even in the middle of a stressful and frustrating situation with somebody else in life. I've tried this this week. I didn't make it up. Another pastor suggested it. I wrote it down and I did it. In the middle of conflict, when I feel anger willing, this is what I say. You know, the problem is, or part of the problem is, I just am not getting what I want. Okay, so it's frustrating. So what? Not the end of the world. Why do I always have to get what I want? Why do I always have to win? Why does the world have to bend its will around me? I'm not getting what I want. That's the problem. And it reveals pride in me. It reveals motive in me. Just that little sentence. Write it down if you want to. Save it. When you find yourself in conflict with your spouse or your kids, your boss, sometimes it passes that test. But I can tell you that in at least 80% of the times that I've tried this week, and I have time tested it all week long, most of the time it doesn't pass the test. I have to let it go. It just doesn't travel well. The underlying cause of anger can be hurt, real hurt hurt that anyone else would be angry at, hurt that even Jesus would be angry at, and that can cause anger. The underlying cause of anger can be fear. And this is where it gets a little bit more hard to pin down. It can be the fear of being wrong about something, the fear of being controlled. Have you ever felt controlled? You never wanna be controlled again? And you say, no matter what I do, no matter what happens, I will never be controlled by anyone again or anything, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. And even anger applied correctly is not a bad thing, but out of control when it makes us cynical, when we expect the worst, well, it can become a character trait. Fear of being treated badly or taken advantage of, or fear of having to deal with your emotions rather than talk about them with a spouse, a friend, a coworker, a kid. It's just easier sometimes not to talk about it. Again, can be a personality trait, but it's still wrong. Some people have to talk about way too much. We just can't let it go, which I'll talk about in a second. But for some, it's just too much work to bring it up. So we say, I'm not gonna do it. And it's not because you love the other person. And it's not because you're really wanting to let it go. It's just because you love yourself more in the moment. So you'd rather not have the conflict. You'd rather not work it out, but you're not gonna let it go. You're gonna put it in your backpack and you're gonna carry it around. And then the next time it happens, you're gonna do the same thing. And you'll look like you're letting it go and you'll smile and you'll nod because it's just too much work to talk about it. And then pretty soon your backpack is full and then something little happens and you snap and you whip out that backpack and bam, you hit somebody over the head with it and they're knocked out and they don't know what happened. And then you find yourself bringing up stuff that happened, you know, five years ago and it's all little stuff, but little stones can hurt if you throw them over and over or in a backpack. And so sometimes we just have to deal with the emotions rather than 
repress or suppress and just let that water keep going under the bridge. All right, we're almost to the end of this first section. I'm gonna get to an important scripture here that's gonna remind you, I think, of the principle that I wanna leave you with before we talk about what we call righteous anger in the next section. Remember this from the summer, from late spring. Love is patient. Love is kind. And this is Christ's love, agape love, the love of commitment, love of choice, the love of I'm not going to quit no matter what, the love of I'm going to do what's right even if I don't want to. Love does not envy, it does not boast, love is not proud. We spent a week on each of these things. We, I mean, we wore this thing out. Love does not dishonor others, it does not seek self first, it's not easily angered. It doesn't keep any record of wrongs. Those two things are kind of a compound thought. And as a reminder, the mental image here, the picture is like an accountant who loves to keep track of numbers and decimal points and columns and categories and spreadsheets and they have it all mapped out. And it's all true, potentially. It's the person who's willing to tear up their spreadsheet because they love who's willing to just let it go because it's not that important and to really let it go. A person who's not gonna keep any record against others or against God. Now you may, if you're listening, you may say, what do you mean keep a record against God? That seems kind of sacrilegious, but I like to be real. And there's some of you who are upset at God. You're angry at God. And if you are, it's okay to talk about it. It's not okay to stay that way, I hope, but it's okay to talk about it. For some of you, life hasn't turned out so far the way that you want it to turn out. And you blame God because God is supposed to be fair. And God says in his own words from his own mouth, I'm not fair in the way that you understand fairness, but I am just. My plan is perfect. You may take some lumps along the way and you may never see what you think evens the score or makes the wrongs right in this life. But if you trust me, you'll be blessed. But we allow our anger to accumulate against God because he's just not doing his job like we were if we were God. It makes us mad. Do you trust him? This last week, I had an experience in trust. And I like the illusion of control. Um, I like to think and feel that I'm in control. I know, you don't have to tell me after church, God's in control, Pastor Rick, you're not in control. I know, but I like to feel like I'm in control. I had a really cool opportunity this week. I'm a chaplain with the State Patrol, most of you guys know that. And I got invited to go to a course called the Emergency Vehicle Operation Course. And this was a course where um, they taught things like pit maneuvers and how to chase bad guys through all kinds of obstacles and how to throw out track or spike strips. And I mean, it was awesome. It's like, I mean, it was like heaven for, for four and a half hours out at the Newton Speedway on this course. And, um, you know, doing the stuff and all that. You know, I mean, it was like a dream, a little boy's dream. And then getting toward the end, they had this thing set up, this course where these troopers, you know, you, you have to chase a bad guy through this cross country course with barbed wire fences, with posts, like, you know, like huge, you know, like, like telephone poles and, and hills and ditches. And, you know, they had to do all kinds of things like call it in as they were going, they were like working on their skills. And they're like, hey, um, chaplain, you ride with the guy in the rabbit car, the instructor, because that's the scariest part. And um, I said, well, I don't really want to ride with the instructor. I'd rather, you know, I mean, chasing seems a whole lot safer than, you know, being the one running. And they're like, well, surely you ran from the cops at some point in your life. But I'm like, as far as you know, I never ran from the cops. Um, so I sat down in the car and I looked at the instructor because after all, my ride was only going to be as good as the instructor right? I mean, that's it. If the instructor wasn't good, I'm dead. And so I'm looking this guy up and down and I'm like, God, oh, he looks a little soft to me. I'm not hundred percent sure. And he looks at me and he goes, you ready to do over hundred on some gravel? 
And um, I said, no, I don't think I am. And he said, buckle up. And we took off. And I remember vividly in my mind thinking, even if I would drive worse, even if I would run into a pole, even if I would Thelma and Louise off the side of this canyon, I would rather be driving because I don't trust this guy. And in some cases, that's the way you feel about God. I'd rather take the wheel. I'd rather run into the pole. I would rather Thelma and Louise my life off a canyon because I just don't trust you, God. And we have to come to the point where we're ready to wipe our record of perceived wrongs and start over again, even if it's in your relationship with God. I can't wait for the rest of this. This is gonna be fun as we kind of close this out. Let's talk right now as we sort of conclude our teaching time on something that we misunderstand often and we would call that, I think, righteous anger. And um, I was reminded of an author who I like to read and I don't really recommend her. The reason that I like to read her is because there's a personal connection. Uh, she grew up and lived in Marin County, California where Joy and I moved to plant a church when our kids were really young. And she was the kind of woman who was far, far from Jesus, the kind of woman who had no interest in Christ, had no interest in really spiritual things, was very um, almost anti-Jesus. Uh, and through a, a long and winding journey, she found Christ, she became a believer, and she began to write about her journey. And in one of her books, uh, she wrote something that has stuck with me. And she said, we know that we have successfully created God in our own image, when it turns out he hates the same people we do. And obviously God doesn't hate people, but we oftentimes act like we do. And we call anger oftentimes righteous anger because we automatically assume that God agrees with me. Well, it's my opinion. Well, they were wrong. Well, this is right. Well, this is what the Bible says. And so we get angry and we immediately assume that Jesus is on our side and that anyone who's not better watch out because with God backing me up, how can I be wrong? And many times we hide behind the mask of what we consider righteous anger. And in reality, all it is is sin that's caused from fear and from frustration, and I get it. But righteous anger in short is being angry about the thing Jesus would be angry about if he were here and being angry about the things Jesus would be angry about in the same way that Jesus would be angry about them and for the same duration that Jesus would be angry about them. Now keep the duration in mind. So you may think that you're on a holy crusade with God backing you up and that you're this religious warrior and there may be some other perspectives or sides that you might should consider today because nobody likes an angry Christian and the world does not need to hear from any more angry people who consider themselves Christ followers. So let's look at this righteous anger. The word is found 450 times, the word anger, in the Old Testament. 375 of these refer to God's anger. And the psalmist in Psalm 7 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. So clearly anger is not sin. But the expressed anger of, well, an impure motive over an incorrect duration can allow Satan to use you as his pawn or puppet, again, getting ahead of myself. So we need to be sure. There's some things to think about if you believe that your anger is righteous anger. Let's look at these things together. First of all, righteous anger cares about other people, not just principles, not just policies, not just politics. That a righteous anger cares about other people, that a righteous anger attacks sin and not sinners, It doesn't want to hurt or retaliate. Righteous anger comes from a place of love and righteous anger desires to bring others to God's truth. There is only one place in this entire world where the ground is level, 
where all differences can be reconciled and where true peace can be found. The only place in this world where the ground is level is the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. And unless and until we are about with our lives meeting anyone else who will come there, then we're part of the problem, not part of the solution. And the anger we have, in fact, is not righteous anger. It's just anger that we are hiding behind, saying that God agrees with us, but in fact, we couldn't be more divisive. Righteous anger seeks restoration, but unrighteous anger seeks destruction. And it's a natural response because the dukes come up when we perceive a threat or when fear begins to to prevail. Some of the things, it's just what we put in our minds. And you know, last week we talked about lust. And so all of us can sit around. We can think about, okay, these are the things I need to stop looking at or these are the shows I need to stop watching. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? If we're watching shows that celebrate adultery, we're watching shows that traffic sex, we're watching shows that take us to places in our minds that we shouldn't go, we should stop watching those shows. But do you know that many times we do the same thing with the news that we consume? that sometimes we put ourselves in the place of triggers, not just to be informed, but to be consumed by all of this bad news and all of this negativity and all of this hatred and all of this division. And pretty soon we find that we're only getting our news and our sources from the most extreme people who we may agree with, but we find that we don't understand anyone else and don't really know what's going on in the world. But we call it Christian. And we sit around and we watch and we watch and we watch and the fear builds and the frustration grows. And the tendency is to become negative and bitter and cynical and to divide and not to unite and righteous anger seeks to restore. But how can we restore if we're not even willing to know if we cut everyone else in our life that we don't agree with out of our life? If Jesus did that, friends, you would not be here today and neither would I. As we continue to Ephesians 4, I want to just point out that the Apostle Paul couldn't be more simple here. He's talking about since we're Christians, how do we live? This is it. It couldn't be any more clear. Four things he talks about. One of these things I skipped with the ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. First thing he talks about is stop telling lies. I'll just read it to you. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are all parts of the same body. Now that's the first thing he says. Now that's an important thing. Then he goes on and talks about anger. Then the third thing he talks about is if stop stealing so that you have enough to give to others. And that has all kinds of applications. Uh, then remember how it is that you're supposed to live because Christ lives within you. So he said, stop lying to each other. Now, first of all, Lies are lies, just, I mean, bullface lies. Sometimes we lie because it's easier than the truth. The truth sometimes causes uncomfortable feelings. And so sometimes we lie because it's the easy way out. White lies. Do these jeans make me look fat? No, it's not the jeans. I mean, you know, white lies. White lies. We've shade the truth. Still sin. Apostle Paul develops all three of these in his writings to the churches. The third thing is exaggeration. We make things better than they seem or worse than they seem to prove a point, to make ourselves look better. The Apostle Paul says, cut it out. There's another type of line, and this one you must be really, really careful. Ah, really careful. If you like what I'm getting ready to say, then you're probably not the person this is intended for. Sometimes a lie can be sitting back and not saying something when something needs to be said. Now, if you're like, preach it, preach it. I can't wait to say what needs to be said. Then it's probably not for you. You probably lost your right to be heard because you've become volatile and dangerous. But it's for those who are thinking, you know, I just don't want to step on toes. I'm just not sure I should speak. And the Apostle Paul, again, when he writes and talks about grace and truth, he talks about being people of grace who speak the truth in love. And if you're living a life that's 80% grace, and then you get to supernaturally interject 20%, let's say, and this is my ratio, maybe you need to be 90-10 for a while, or perhaps a 95-5 to correct some things that maybe, you know, 
But in you interject when the Holy Spirit gives an opportunity to nudge somebody toward truth with an open arm, not a closed fist, but you choose not to do it, that's a form of lying. The Apostle Paul says, stop lying. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are all parts of the same body and don't sin by letting anger control you. No, he doesn't say don't sin by, by getting angry. He says, don't sin by letting anger control you. I remember Jesus in the book of Mark, we read a story about going to the temple. Jesus was going to church and there was a man there on a Sunday. The Jews believed you couldn't heal on a Sunday, that you couldn't do any you know, miracles or you couldn't work on a Sunday. They had a lot of rules. And they knew this man needed to be healed. His hand was withered. And they were watching Jesus to see if he was gonna heal the man and violate the Sabbath law. And Jesus, the Bible says, was angry. And he wasn't angry at the political system. He was angry at the religious system, the people who cared more about points than principles, more about points than people. And he healed the man's hand. And they looked at Jesus and hated him and conspired to kill him because how dare he? And the word that's used for Jesus' anger was the kind of anger that's used for boiling over and blowing your top. And he managed to do that without sinning. But anger has an expiration date. And you're gonna see this in this next little phrase. Even righteous anger, even being angry about the things that Jesus, now this is what I want you really to listen to right now. We're not, we don't have too much longer. This is really important. Even the things you're supposed to be angry about, they have an expiration date. It's 12 hours or 17 if you work hard and don't sleep very much. Manna given to the children of Israel when they wandered the desert after being freed from Egypt. They were given manna to eat during the day, which only gave them enough food for the day that day. And if they tried to squirrel it away in their tent, you know what happened? It rotted and they couldn't eat it. Anger is just like that. And the apostle Paul says, don't be consumed with anger. Even if you are angry and even if your anger is constructive and even if your anger is for people, not against them. And even if you want to be part of the solution, uh, then, then you still have to be careful not to let it consume you. And then he gives an illustration or an example. He says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, stay up with your husband or wife until three o'clock in the morning and hash out all your differences. And if you happen to fall asleep before you reconcile, then your marriage is doomed forever. It's not what Paul's saying at all. What he's saying is, is that if you allow yourself to be consumed even with the right kinds of things over and over and over again, that it does something to your heart. Well, what's it do? What it does to your heart is it gives the devil a foothold and you become cynical, you become bitter, you become pessimistic and you become dangerous. And he says, at the end of the night, let it go. At the end of the day, give it to the Lord. Here's my offering today, God, my anger. Now you may pick it up again in the morning because there's some things going on in our world that really make me mad. And there's some things that I think Jesus would be mad about, but it doesn't give me the excuse to fight the Lord's battles with the devil's means. And too many Christians are great at defining the problem. One of the most aggravating seminary professors I ever had in all of my education he was a church administration professor. The statute of limitations has run out on this. It's been over 20 years, so I can't be penalized. My grade can't be revoked. And all he did the entire class was define the problems. Define the problems. He could define every problem. When you go and you pastor a church, and by the way, he'd never pastored a church. He'd been an interim from time to time, which is not the same as pastoring a church. Never pastor a church. You're gonna run into this when you pastor a church. And he would define the problem. You're gonna run into this when you pastor a church. And he'd define the problem. And I raised my hand. I don't know, two thirds of the way into the semester. And I said, could you please give us a solution instead of just defining the problem? We get there's gonna be a lot that we go through, but could you just give us a solution? Because as pastors, defining the problem spreads like the plague. As Christians, defining the problem spreads like the plague. But being part of the solution, that's where the supernatural begins. And we're so good and I'm guilty, I'm not at you, I'm not mad at you, I'm with you, of as soon as we start talking to another Christian and we perceive they're from the same perspective or worldview we are, we start griping about how bad the world is. And it becomes an infection. 
And Christians should be the most optimistic and positive people in the world. And you ask me why. And if you say why, I want to show you because the apostle Paul showed us in this writing here. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, this is why you should be optimistic. I should be. He's identified us as his own. He's claimed us as his kids, guaranteeing that he's coming again. And you can say, well, the world's the worst it's ever been. And I would tell you, be a student of world history and you'll realize it's not. It's the worst the modern world has been, but not the worst the world has been. Politics have been worse. Human rights have been worse. I mean, everything we complain about has been worse. But the one thing that we know for sure is with every day we live, we're closer to Jesus coming again. And whether or not you think this is the worst it's ever gonna be and it's the end of times and I mean, you're throwing your hands up and the sky is falling, Jesus is coming and he's claimed you as his own. And friends, that's reason to be optimistic. But we live like we're defeated, like Satan's won. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Paul's covering a list here because he's talking about interactions between Christians. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Okay, last week we talked about the same thing we talked about the week before, and we'll talk about it next week. Remember self-discipline. Discipline, choosing between what you want now and what you want most. If you are willing to answer the question, what do I want most, by saying to God and to yourself, I don't wanna be an angry person anymore. I don't wanna be known as an angry person. I don't want my kids to become angry. I don't want my husband or wife to suffer from my anger. I don't want my friends to be infected by my anger. I wanna change. Then what is it that you are willing to do or stop doing to change your behavior? Because we're a sum total of the choices that we've made. Now, this is not in your notes. It's something that I've been working on this week personally in my own devotional life. And I decided to share it with you late, which means that, well, maybe it is. I don't know. I texted Jared last night, Pastor Jared, and said, hey, can you add this? He loves it when I do that at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. And I ask him to add stuff to things he's already long since, um, you know, published and, and uploaded to your app. But these are some things that I've been doing to help deal with my anger. And they work if you're ready to take it seriously. If you're angry about a person, they were wrong, they did hurt me or mine, and I'm mad. And you're right, or mostly right, or partly right. What do we do? I don't have time to develop where this comes from, but you and I have been together long enough for you to know this comes from scripture because we have talked about these principles exhaustively. Number one, I'm commanded to forgive them. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean I need to have a relationship with them. It doesn't mean there aren't consequences, but it means that in my heart, I have to give the offense to Jesus so that I can be free. I have to. I have to pray for them. Not that God's gonna smite them or smote them or give them boils and you know, terrible you know, uh, physical ailments and make them broke and I don't know but that God will bring them back to a right relationship with him if they've strayed, if they're not saved, that they would find a relationship with Jesus. And you pray for them the same way you would want someone to pray for you if you had done the same thing, or if you can't imagine doing the same thing, the things that you do to other people that you overlook, but for some reason you're not forgiving this one thing. And then the third thing, and this has really made a difference for me and I hope it'll make a difference for you. Ask for compassion for your enemies, for the people who've wronged you. God, can you help me walk a mile in their shoe? Not literally, but to see things from their perspective. Can you connect me in some way? And when I've asked God to do this, friends, this begins to chip away at the hardness of my heart. And I wish I had more time, I don't, but this is how it happens in my life. I'll say, God, make me compassionate. Let me see him with compassion, give me some compassion. And he'll do it and I'm like, ah, I didn't want that compassion. I don't wanna feel that for them. I ask him at the same time, I don't want it because then I have to act on it. But it causes me to think differently and to respond differently. And here's the sum total, the result. My heart begins to get soft when I can make it so hard. All right, if you're not upset at a person, but 
you are upset or angry at a process. This isn't fair. It's taking too long. My illness won't go away. My boss is a jerk. My marriage is in shambles. The kids are terrible. Um, Make it stop. Give me answers. I've prayed for this. You keep saying no. If you're just getting worn out or worn down by the process and you're angry, I'm just not sure I trust you driving God anymore. I'm going to suggest to you some things to do. Number one, and this is a dangerous thing to do, but it's a biblical thing to do. Pray for patience, endurance. And pray for perspective. God, I don't see things the way you see them because I would be a different kind of God. Now, I don't want to be God. I just want you to act more like me. Isn't that an honest prayer? If any of you lacks wisdom, a point of view, this is what wisdom means. Viewing life like God sees life. That's what wisdom is. If any of you lacks it, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it'll be given to you. And then number three, pray for peace in the process of patient endurance and God's perspective. Because God never claims to be fair, but he claims to be just. And he sees you and he cares and he loves you. Number three, and finally, if you are angry at a perspective, I had to alliterate, it's not the best word, but this is what I mean. The world view, the world as it's unfolding. It's not the way I think it should be. It's not the way it ought to be. They're making it worse. Whether it be the Republicans, the Democrats, the whoever, they're making it worse. If they would just stop, if we would, and we're angry at it. And you may be right. Pray for God's plan. Because you know what? I don't know what God's plan is, but I know he has one. And sometimes God's plan surprises me. And I'm gonna tell you a secret. Sometimes it's different than what I'm praying for. And I'm like, all right, God, you're driving. I get it. I'm buckling up. I'm in for the ride. Show me what your plan is. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Confess your fear or frustration and ask God for an attitude of optimism. Here's the final thing I leave you with before a passage of scripture that I want you to remember this week. Commit yourself to being part of the solution, not contributing to the problem. Whether it be in your marriage, with your kids, with your friends, with your family, at your job, in your church, in your community, or in your world. Today's the day it stops and I will be part of the solution, no longer part of the problem. Remember the Apostle Paul when he said, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I want to read to you a passage of scripture to leave you. And I want you to remember this. It's in your notes, on your PDF, on your app. Psalm 4, 4 through 8. And I've skipped a little of it in there. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it literally at night. Give it to the Lord and remain silent. Offer sacrifices. The translation is spend time with God and with other people in the right spirit, a constructive, optimistic spirit, a spirit that's committed to being part of the solution and trust who God's plan, the Lord. Now listen to this last, this last verse. This is what I want. This is our last one. We're almost done. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. Father, thank you for the time we've spent together and I pray for my friends who are here struggling with this subject. It's so complicated, so involved, so interconnected. Our own motives oftentimes are unclear to us and it's so easy to fall into the trap of just defining the problem over and over and over. We sit in our homes and are consumed with social media and the news that just reinforces our negativity and our pessimism and we forget that you have a plan, that you are in control and as much as you've called us to be light, to be informed, but to be part of the solution instead of contributing to the problem, 
You've also promised to give us the strength, the wisdom, the insight, the stick to to partner with you, with each other, to light a candle in this dark world. The only safe place to meet is the level ground at the foot of the cross. And I pray, Father, that in spite of our anger, that we do everything in our power relying on yours to nudge the people in our lives to come to that cross with us. I pray it with confidence in Jesus' name. Amen.